All right, let's start again. Take two. Anyways, our project is the uh, Motorcycle Angle Data Logger. And this is Travis, Darren, Brandon, and myself, William. And uh, our objective was to log data for motorcycle angles in two positions, roll defined as um, as if the bike is leaning side to side and pitch as if it's leaning up and down like the uh, demonstrated wheelie we have going on here. And so the first thing we come to is the hardware design. Uh, for this design we had to use uh, two GPIOs in BitPing. Right. There's uh, the ITG3200 which is the gyroscope which tells us the angle after a calculation. Actually, it uses accelerometers, and then the SD card, which also had to be bit banged, uses a spy interface. So yeah, so then we have uh, we have two switches on the device. We have switch zero, which basically, when it's in the low position, uh, no data is being logged. When it's in the high position, it creates a new file with a unique name that's numerically incremented as the program is continually running. So that way, you can turn it on and off and log multiple data sessions. And then we've got switch one, that when you set it high, it basically ex exits the application, uh, unmounts the file system, closes all the file buffers, gets all that going straight. And then as far as, uh, and then as far as software design goes, basically follows this flow chart. We, when the application starts, it initializes the IC squared. From there, it then initializes the file system. And then checks switch zero. If switch zero is not set, it just kind of like sits in a while loop. When switch zero is set, it initializes a new file. From there, it then reads data, and then writes the data to the SD card, and then checks switch one if switch one is not set. It then keeps in that cycle re reading and writing data. If switch zero goes low, it closes the file. Switch zero then goes high again and creates a new file, as I just mentioned. And then once switch one is set, it closes the, the file system, which is on the SD card. Uh, so the ITG 3200 is the gyro we used. It's um, it's a three, like has a three different gyros on it for all three uh, you know, axes, but we only decided to use two of them because uh, we decided that you wouldn't be able to pick anything up from um, the uh, Y axis or the, F, the Z axis actually, because when you're turning, there's not much of acceleration there. Is what this uh, gyro picks up. Um, it's not actually a position; it's um, angular acceleration. So. We have to do some calculations to actually try to get position, and we'll talk about that later. And it uses, like I said before, it uses IC squared, which um, unfortunately, because Xilinx doesn't provide a module for it, we have to bit bang it, um, which had its up pros and cons. It's a little easier to debug, but um, it's easy to make mistakes. And there's a lot of mistakes that I had to correct it. Um, and as the slide says, we sample data at a rate of 20 hertz off the gyro. Um, the actual gyro itself actually samples uh, the gyros faster than that, but um, we actually pull data off those registers at a set rate. And uh, we're not taking advantage of the interrupts that are provided by the gyro or anything. So then here's, um, so just like before, you spy, um, SD cards in their spec have a spy mode that you can use, which a lot of embedded systems used. Uh, we've used it before. And um, so again, we write at a rate of 20 hertz because that's how we're sampling the data. So every time we sample the data, we write out to the card. And we didn't have any problems with you know, it sampling too fast and anything getting um, messed up with basically missing interrupts or anything like that. Um, and we're using Elm Chan's FAT file system module, which is this, uh, this guy wrote basically a FAT32 module for embedded systems. And so basically all you have to do is write the low-level like spy functions for it. And there was one, one little tweak that we had to make to it to make it work uh, for the initialization, but <coughs> otherwise it works flawlessly. Um, only problem with it is it's very, it's pretty big for an embedded system. Uh, we had to increase our memory size, our instruction memory to 32K, <coughs> and also the stack size, we had to increase it by like, yeah, 800 four, hex. Yeah, 800 hex, which is four, four times. Four or five? 800 times. This is four. It's 100 hex is the default stack size, but we have to increase it to 800 hex to get it to work. Yeah, that's fast. Otherwise, like when we were debugging, it'd be like, you'd be walking through and then you'd hit a math problem and the program would just yeah. not work. So, so how, does, how, how the microboys reacts to stack overflows and <laughs> stack problems, it just stops executions. 
So it's very hard to debug it because you expect the code to do something and it doesn't do anything. And so yeah, this kind of covers the integration and testing. Uh, we bit bang the IC squared because of the issue that Darren had mentioned. Initially, we had started using the spy module, which is included in the Xilinx EDK, and it wasn't working. And now, upon further like conclusions, it's probably because the stack size was too small, which we didn't realize was the problem at the time. So we just went and bit banged it. But ultimately, it ended up working for the best because the the module was too limited in the capabilities that it provided as far as sending for the initialization. The SD card requires sending. Uh, 80, clocks, clock cycles. 80 clocks to it while the chip select is held high, and the, which the module yeah, doesn't allow. The spy module won't let you toggle the clock <coughs> unless you set chip select low. Right, right. It's, so we it's kind of a smart. It's kind of smart, but for this application, we need it. And since you can't tie multiple outputs to the same bin unless we start messing with multiplexers and stuff like that, it's just not really worth it. And so it worked out. Yeah, there's plenty of examples of fit banging spy too. We've we've done it before, so it's not. It wasn't horrible. So here's a sample graph. This was just uh, this was me when I was testing it working on my on my desk. Uh, this is after we had done the integration, which is a trapezoidal approximation to get uh, to try to get a degree position. And basically, you can see it works pretty. And these are the number of samples along the bottom, and then this is degrees. And you would tilt it up, and it would flatline right here, and then you would set it back down. And as you can see, it doesn't actually go back to zero. And that's the problem that we encountered, which was drift. So in order to do this properly, you need both uh, accelerometer, accelerometer and, a gyro, and a gyro. Yeah, to, to account for drift. And it's a known thing. And it's, um, it's called a Kalman filter is what they commonly use, where they use the data from both devices to uh, account for this. Because you notice every time it starts moving that it just gets more offset. Because this is going to about 20, goes back to zero. But you see now everything's offset by about five degrees. And you see that it just messes up. Like when we initially tested it, it we went to 45, 0, 90, 0. And you can see after that first uh, movement, everything would be offset by like 15 degrees or so. And then the next time you move it, would get offset by another amount. And again, it's just because when you actually use the gyro, you're using an accelerometer. And you use both devices together to get accurate data. And you need them to counterbalance each other because of their weaknesses and strengths that they have. So that's the presentation, now let's move on to the demo.